Chapter Six of The Other Side of the Sun Fairy Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. The Other Side of the Sun Fairy Stories by Evelyn Sharp. Chapter Six The Tears of Princess Prunella. There was no doubt that the Princess Prunella would have been the most charming little girl on either side of the sun, if she had not been so exceedingly cross and discontented. She was as pretty as any one could wish to see, and as accomplished as all the gifts of fairyland could make her, and she had every bit of happiness that the love of her parents and the wit of her fairy godmother could put in her way. And yet she grumbled, and grumbled, and grumbled. "'Can you not try to be happy just for five minutes?' asked the queen in despair. "'How can you expect me to be happy even for five minutes, "'when every five minutes is exactly like the last five minutes?' sighed the little princess. "'It is tea time, your highness,' said the head nurse, coaxingly. "'And there are pink sugar cakes for tea.' "'There were pink sugar cakes yesterday,' pouted the princess, there are always pink sugar cakes, unless there are white sugar cakes, and I am equally tired of them both. Can you not tell me something new? Let her go without her tea, said the king, who was rather tired of having such a cross little daughter. But the queen only smiled. The child wants a change, she remarked. It must be very dull to play alone all day. Dull? exclaimed the king. Why should it be dull? "'Has not her godmother given her such wonderful toys "'that they can play with her as well as be played with?' "'This was quite true, "'for the very ball that the princess threw "'to the other end of the nursery "'could catch itself and throw itself back to her. "'And it is not every ball that can do that.' "'What more can the child want?' "'demanded the king crossly. "'The queen, however, thought there might be something more.' "'We must find her a playfellow,' she said wisely. "'Stuff and nonsense,' protested the king. "'Why should we bring any more crying children into the palace? "'However, you must do as you like, I suppose.' "'The king always told the queen to do as she liked "'when he was tired of the conversation, "'so the queen smiled again and issued a proclamation at once "'to tell the whole world that the Princess Prunella "'wanted someone to play with.' and would be ready to choose a playfellow that day week at twelve o'clock in the morning. Now, it is not often that one gets a chance of playing with a king's daughter, so it is no wonder that, when the princess followed her royal parents into the great hall on the appointed day, she found it filled from end to end with all the little princes and princesses, and all the little counts and countesses, and all the little dukes and duchesses that the surrounding kingdoms could produce." "'I never had a more excellent idea,' said the queen, as she seated herself on the throne and looked down at the crowd of children. "'Prunella has talked of nothing else for a whole week, and she has not been heard to grumble once.' "'That's all very well,' observed the king, a little uneasily. "'But it is quite clear that she cannot play with them all, and who knows that so much disappointment will not lead to a war?' The queen did not answer, but turned to her little daughter, who stood by her side. "'Do not be in a hurry,' she said to her. "'So many faces are confusing at first, and you might regret it afterwards if you make a mistake.' But the Princess Prunella showed no signs of being in a hurry. She just glanced over the sea of faces that were turned towards her, and then looked speechlessly at her mother. The smiles had all gone from her face, and the big blue eyes were filled with tears. "'Why?' They are all exactly alike, she said piteously. I cannot tell one from another. And to the astonishment of everyone in the room, she dropped down on the steps of the throne and began to cry. Dear, dear, what is to be done? exclaimed the queen, in much alarm. It will look so bad if all the children have to be sent home again. It will certainly lead to a war, was all the king said. And then they both looked helplessly at their sobbing little daughter. As for all the children, they were so surprised at hearing how much alike they were that they said nothing at all, and it is difficult to tell what would have been the end of the matter if the princess had not suddenly jumped to her feet again and pointed towards the door. "'There is the prince I should like to play with,' she exclaimed. "'He is not like the others. 
for he has a wonderful look on his face. Everybody looked round at the doorway, and, sure enough, there stood a boy whom no one had noticed before. "'Come here, prince,' commanded the princess, raising her voice haughtily. "'You may kiss my hand if you like.' But the boy drew back with a bewildered air and shook his head. Princess Prunella stamped her foot angrily. "'How dare you hesitate when I tell you to come here!' she cried. At this, however, the strange boy turned and hastened out of the room altogether, and a loud murmur of astonishment rose from the children. The king's daughter had never been disobeyed in her life before, and for a moment she was too astonished to speak. "'Who is he? What is his name?' she demanded at last. There was a pause, broken presently by the shrill voice of one of the pages. "'Please, your highness, it is only deaf Robert, the minstrel's son,' he said. "'Deaf,' repeated the princess, "'what is that?' "'It means that he cannot hear anything, little daughter,' explained the queen. "'So, you see, he would not do for a playfellow at all. "'Besides, he is not even a prince. "'Can you not choose one of these others instead?' "'The princess, however, could do nothing of the kind. "'All these are alike,' she said again. "'But the minstrel's son has a wonderful look on his face, "'and I will have no one else for a playfellow.' "'So all the children went sadly back to their homes,' and wondered why they were so much alike, and the whole court was made uncomfortable once more by the sulkiness of Princess Prunella. "'Your Highness's best wax doll has not been out for two whole days,' suggested the head nurse. The princess snatched the doll from her hands and threw it to the floor. "'If you will not let me play with a boy who is deaf, how can you expect me to play with a doll?' she asked, and although, no doubt, there was much in what she said, it was hardly the way in which to speak to the head nurse. Indeed, there would have been a serious disturbance in the royal nursery the very next minute, if the princess's cream-colored pony had not suddenly trotted round from the stable of his own accord, and put it into her head to go for a ride. Now, the princess's pony was, of course, a fairy pony, so when he ran away with her in the forest that day, it was not to be supposed that he would run away with her for nothing. He took her, in fact, for a real fairy ride, all through a fairy forest, that began by being quite a baby forest, and then grew and grew, the deeper she went into it, until it ended in being quite a grown-up forest. And the pony never stopped running until he reached a dear little grey house that was set in the brightest of flower gardens, right in the middle of the forest." The princess slipped off his back, and pushed open a little gate, and walked into the flower garden. Anyone else might have been surprised to find deaf Robert sitting there, in the middle of the trim green lawn, but after a fairy ride one is never surprised at anything. So the princess's heart just gave one big leap for joy, and she ran straight up to him and took his hand. "'Poor deaf boy! Poor deaf boy!' she said softly. Certainly she was not behaving like a king's daughter, for she ought to have been extremely angry with him for disobeying her in the morning, instead of which she spoke as gently to him as any ordinary girl might have done. But then, as he could not hear what she said to him, what was the use of speaking like a princess? "'Poor deaf boy,' she repeated, bending over him. "'No wonder you look so dull and unhappy.' It was the first time in her life that she had forgotten she was a princess, and she was quite surprised at the gentleness of her own voice. She was still more surprised when the deaf boy rose to his feet and bowed very low and answered her. "'I was only unhappy, princess, because I could not hear what you said to me this morning,' he explained. "'Oh,' cried the princess, "'you can hear me now.' "'Ah, yes,' said deaf Robert. "'I can hear you now because you speak so kindly. It is only when people are angry and speak roughly that I cannot hear them.' That is why they say I am deaf. "'Have you always been deaf?' asked the princess, wonderingly. "'Ever since the wimps came to my christening,' answered the minstrel's son. "'For when they asked my father what gift he would choose for me, he chose that I should be deaf to every sound that was not beautiful.' "'So that is why you have such a wonderful look on your face,' said Princess Prunella. "'I wish the wimps went to everybody's christening.' Deaf Robert shook his head. If they had not come to mine, he remarked, I should have been able to hear what you said to me this morning. Never mind, said the princess. Come back to the palace with me now, 
I will never speak crossly to you again, and then you will always be able to hear what I say. No, no, answered Robert, shrinking back. I cannot come to the town. It is so silent there. It frightens me. Silent, echoed the princess. Surely it is the forest that is silent. Oh, no, said the minstrel's son, smiling. The forest is full of sound. Can you not hear them all talking? The bees and the flowers and the great pine trees. Princess Prunella listened. No, she said, shaking her head. I can hear nothing. Then she took the deaf boy's hands and pulled him toward the gate. Come back to the town with me, she said eagerly. It is true that you cannot hear the other people's voices, but you will always be able to hear me, and that is ever so much more important. So the minstrel's son went back to the palace with Princess Prunella, and when the king and queen saw how happy their little daughter was at last, they said nothing more about deaf Robert not being a prince, but got over the difficulty by making him a marquis on the spot, and giving him the appointment of playfellow-in-chief to her royal highness. A magnificent banquet was given to celebrate this important event, at which several speeches were made by the king, and several tunes were played by the band, but as the speeches were exceedingly pompous, and the tunes were exceedingly noisy, the new marquis, for whom they were intended, heard neither one nor the other. However, he heard every word that the little princess whispered in his ear, and perhaps that was all he wished to hear. Never had life passed so peacefully at the palace as in the days that followed. The princess was never heard to utter an angry word, and she went about with a contented look on her face that cheered the hearts of all who knew her. It was indeed a happy day for the court when the minstrel's son came to play with the king's daughter, and every one rejoiced that the king and queen had been wise enough to let their little daughter have her own way. But all this while no one thought of the minstrel's son. Now, anybody might suppose that a minstrel's son, who suddenly found himself made into a marquis and playfellow-in-chief to a princess, would be the happiest boy in the world. And yet— Although he grew fonder every day of his little playfellow, deaf Robert was the saddest person in the whole court. He grew more and more silent as the days went on, until at last even the princess noticed that he was changed. "'The wonderful look has gone from your face,' she said to him. "'Can it be that you do not feel happy at court?' Then the boy Marquis told her the truth. "'I am unhappy because I cannot hear the sounds of the town,' he said." Will not your father go and live in the forest for a change, so that we can play there together instead of in this horrible, silent place? But I don't want to go and play in the forest, objected the princess. There are no people in the forest, and I should forget I was a person myself, if I had nothing to talk to but the flowers and the trees. For the first time since they had played together, deaf Robert remembered that he was nearly two years older than the little princess, and he smiled in a superior manner. "'That is only because you hear all the wrong things,' he said. "'If you could once hear the sounds of the forest, "'you would never want to come back to the town.' "'The princess turned red with anger, "'and she opened her mouth to give the minstrel's son "'a thorough good scolding, "'which would certainly have surprised him "'had he been able to hear it. "'But she remembered in time "'that he would not be able to hear it. "'So she sighed impatiently "'and answered him as softly as she could. "'You are quite mistaken,' she said, putting her chin in the air. If you were a real boy, you would understand. And with that, she turned and left him. It was certainly annoying not to be able to lose her temper whenever she felt inclined, but there was nothing to prevent her from remembering that she was a princess. That afternoon, the princess pricked her finger, and the minstrel's son found out that what she said was quite true, for he was not a real boy at all. For, of course, the princess did what any other little girl of twelve years old would have done, and burst into tears, while the minstrel's son, who was quite unable to hear her sobs, only stared at her solemnly, and wondered why her pretty round face had suddenly twisted itself into such a strange expression. "'What are you doing, Prunella?' he asked her gravely. "'Doing?' wept the princess. "'Why, I'm crying, of course.' That is what you would be doing if you had pricked your finger as badly as I have. She held out her small white finger as she spoke, but the minstrel's son only stared at her as solemnly as before. Crying? What is that? he asked. And why should you do anything so useless? 
Surely it would be better to fetch a doctor or a piece of sticking plaster. Princess Prunella came to the end of her patience. It had been bad enough to exist for six whole weeks without being allowed to lose her temper once, but now that she found she could not even cry with any pleasure, she felt it was more than any little girl of twelve years old could be expected to bear. It isn't sticking plaster that I want, she said miserably. When people cry, they want to be comforted, of course. Do they, said deaf Robert, looking perplexed. But if I cannot hear you cry, how am I to comfort you? The princess was far too cross to be reasonable, though she managed to remember that it was no use letting her crossness appear in her voice. That's just it, she sobbed. You ought to be able to hear me cry, and then you would be a real boy. And the princess pitied herself so much for being forced to play with someone who was not real that she buried her face in her hands and wept more than ever. She half hoped, even then, that deaf Robert would come and kiss her and make friends again, as any nice boy would have done at once. But deaf Robert did nothing of the kind, and when she at last took her hands from her eyes, her playfellow was gone. Truly, the forest had never looked so beautiful as on that day when the minstrel's son hastened through it on his way to his old home. The flowers looked their best, and the birds sang their merriest, and the trees bent their greenest boughs to give him a welcome. But the boy with the wonderful look on his face, who had lived among them for so long, never paused so much as to glance at them, and they only had time to notice, as he passed them by, that the wonderful look was no longer there. On he hurried until he came to the little gray house, set in its garden of bright-colored flowers, and he pushed open the gate and walked in, just as his princess had done six weeks ago. The minstrel was at home, this time, and he was sitting on the doorstep in the sunshine. He had just composed a new song, and that always made him extremely happy. But he sighed a little when he saw his son come in at the gate, for he, too, had no difficulty in seeing that the wonderful look had gone from the boy's face. "'What is the matter, my son?' he asked anxiously. Deaf Robert wasted no time in greeting him. "'Father,' he cried, "'why did you ask the wimps to my christening?' "'That is easily answered,' said the minstrel soothingly. "'It was because I wished you to hear nothing but beautiful sounds all your life.' "'But what sounds do you call beautiful?' demanded his son. The minstrel smiled. "'Can you not hear the music?' he asked. "'Yes, yes,' said Deaf Robert. "'But what else?' It had never struck the minstrel that there need be anything else, and he hesitated a little. Well, he said at last, can you not hear the sounds of the forest? Deaf Robert looked up at the pine trees overhead and down to the flowers at his feet. I used to be able to, he said sadly, but even the forest has grown silent now. Then he clenched his fists and looked imploringly at his father. Must I live to the end of my days without hearing any of the things that other boys hear? he cried. "'You are a little unreasonable, my son,' said the minstrel. "'Are not the beautiful sounds of life enough for you?' "'Enough,' said deaf Robert. "'I want much, much more than that, father. "'Why, I want to hear the princess cry.' "'That is nonsense,' exclaimed the minstrel. "'Tears make a most unpleasant sound, "'and you would be extremely disappointed "'if you were to hear the princess cry.' "'The minstrel's son drew himself up proudly.' You do not understand. You are not real either, he said. The tears of my princess make the sweetest sound in the world, and I am not going to rest until I learn how to hear it. Then he turned and walked through the gate and out into the forest once more. The minstrel looked after him and sighed. It was the best gift I could think of, he murmured. It was the one I would have chosen for myself. It is true, he added thoughtfully that I never wanted to play with a king's daughter. The minstrel's son wandered aimlessly through the forest, the forest that he had once liked so well because it was all his, and that he only liked now because he had found his little princess in it, and there he might have been wandering still if he had not suddenly met a wimp. This was not really surprising in that particular forest, for it was just the kind of forest in which any boy of fourteen might at any minute meet a wimp, and 
but for all that, deaf Robert was just a little bit startled when the wimp suddenly dropped in his path from the tree above and nodded at him. Hello, said the wimp. What is the matter with you? I am very unhappy because I am not a real boy, explained deaf Robert. Dear me, how is that? asked the wimp, pretending to be surprised. Well, you ought to know, answered deaf Robert. It is all because the wimps came to my christening. Nothing of the sort, cried the wimp indignantly. It's all because your father insisted on knowing better than we did, and we let him have his own way. If the wimps had not been at your christening, you would not even want to be a real boy. So you cannot hear the princess cry, eh? That's a good wimpish joke, that is. And the wimp stood on his head and choked with laughter. It's all very well for you to laugh, complained the minstrel's son. You don't know how unpleasant it is to be a boy without being a real boy. The wimp came down on his toes again and stopped laughing. Then why don't you go and learn to be a real boy, he asked in surprise. How can I find out the way? asked deaf Robert. You ridiculous boy, exclaimed the wimp. Why, the first person you meet will be able to tell you that. Deaf Robert had no time to thank him for his information, for the wimp began turning somersaults the moment he had finished speaking, and he went on turning them until he turned into nothing at all, and there was no more wimp to be seen. Then the minstrel's son walked on through the forest, and for three days and three nights he met no one at all, but on the morning of the fourth day he came to the very edge of the forest, and there he saw an old woman sitting by the side of a blackberry bush. Hurrah! cried deaf Robert waving his cap. Do you know that you are the first person I have met, and that you are going to tell me how to become a real boy? I will tell you at once, said the old woman, smiling, for you come straight to the point, and do not beat about the bush. This is what you must do, then. Something brave, and something kind, and something foolish, and something wise. If you are not a real boy after that, it will be your own fault." Then she walked round the blackberry bush and disappeared, and although deaf Robert forgot what she had just said about him, and beat about the bush in good earnest, he never saw any more of her. Then the minstrel's son walked straight on in search of a brave deed to do, and this did not take him long, for there are always plenty of brave deeds waiting to be done by someone. So, long before the sun was above his head that day, he came to a castle where a beautiful princess was being kept captive by a cruel old giant, all because he was cruel, and for no other reason at all. And when deaf Robert saw the princess weeping behind the bars of her prison window, he was reminded of his own little princess, whom he had left weeping on the nursery floor, and that made him call on the giant instantly to come out and be killed. The giant laughed a great laugh, and came out into the courtyard, not to be killed, but to kill the minstrel's son instead. But before he had time to do that, the minstrel's son had managed to kill him, and there was an end of the cruel old giant. "'That is the bravest deed I have ever seen done,' cried the princess, when he fetched her out of her dungeon. "'Brave deeds are easily done, then,' said deaf Robert. But he was glad enough, all the same, to hear that he had done the first part of his task. The next thing he did was to take the beautiful princess back to her own country, and that seemed to him a great waste of time, for he could not certainly do his kind deed so long as he had the princess on his hands. But when they reached her country, and the princess told her father how deaf Robert had come out of his way to bring her home, the old king was pleased, and asked him what reward he would like for his trouble. For, he said, you have done the kindest deed anyone could possibly think of. No reward for me, laughed deaf Robert, for there is my kind deed done without my knowing it and he set off once more on his travels. After that the minstrel's son wandered about for a great many days, for neither a wise nor a foolish deed could he find to do. Sometimes when he thought he had been wise, the people told him he was cruel and drove him out of their country, and sometimes when he was sure he had been foolish, they only praised him for his kindness. He grew tired and footsore, and his clothes became old and ragged, and he almost forgot that he had once been a marquis and playfellow-in-chief to a princess. But he never forgot how the little princess Prunella had looked as she sat on the nursery floor and wept with sobs that he was not able to hear. 
So two years passed away, and still he had not learned how to be a real boy. One day, as he was walking along a country road, he came upon a girl driving cows. "'Why are you looking so sad?' she asked him. "'Because I left my princess crying in her nursery two years ago, and I have been away from her ever since,' answered the boy, simply. The girl burst out laughing. "'Well,' she exclaimed, "'that was a foolish thing to do.' foolish shouted deaf robert did you say foolish to be sure i did laughed the girl could anything be more foolish than to keep away from someone whom you want to be with then i will go back to her this very instant declared the minstrel's son and that would be the wisest thing you could do answered the girl and she immediately disappeared cows and all which just shows that she must have been a wimp all the while well said deaf robert there are my wise and my foolish deeds done together, and now I am a real boy. Then off he set homewards as fast as he could go, and although it had taken him two years to come away from home, it only took him two hours to get back again, so it is clear that the wimps must have had a hand in that, too. And just about tea-time he stood outside the nursery door in the palace of his own little princess. It is well to remember that the wimps had come to the christening of the minstrel's son, otherwise it might seem a little wonderful that the princess prunella should have pricked her finger again on the very day that her playfellow-in-chief came back to her anyhow that is what had happened and as the minstrel's son stood outside the door and listened he heard the softest and sweetest and the prettiest sound he had ever heard in his life hurrah he cried at last i can hear the princess cry and he burst open the door and ran into the room all in his rags and his tatters, and knelt down to comfort the king's daughter. "'Only look at my finger,' wept Princess Prunella, as she showed him her little hand. Truly it was impossible to tell which of her small white fingers the princess had pricked, but as the minstrel's son kissed every one of them in turn, it is clear that he must have healed the right one, and that, of course, was why the princess stopped crying at once." Then she looked at her old playfellow, and laughed for joy to see him there again. "'The wonderful look has come back into your face,' she said. "'But it is ever so much more wonderful than before.' "'Dear little playfellow,' whispered the minstrel's son, "'I can hear the forest sounds again, too. But you were right all the time, and the sounds of the town are much more charming than the sounds of the forest.' "'Oh, no,' declared the princess. There you are quite mistaken, for the sounds of the forest are more beautiful by far. And it is a fact that they have been disputing the point ever since. End of chapter 6